Hello, everybody. My name is John Mark Johnson, Jr. I'm the host of Relationship and Truth, and today I'm going to be interacting with Samuel Nason of Explain Apologetics. First off, Samuel, I probably butchered your name. If that is the case, I'm very sorry. Um, I also understand that you are a student at the time, or at least at the time that you made the video that I'm going to be interacting with, and um, I don't know where you are in the process of degree and all that, and so if there is a title uh, that would be applicable to you and I have not used it, I apologize for that as well. As to the subject of what we're going to be talking about, we're going to be talking about an item that came up in a video that Samuel did a little while back on the topic of modern apostles. In this video that I'm referencing, and if I remember I'll try to put a link down in the description box, uh, Samuel gave five reasons for why we shouldn't call people apostles in the modern. And he was especially trying to get people not to think of modern individuals as if they were like the 12 apostles of the New Testament. That was his real main thrust, uh, was saying basically that there are no apostles in the modern age, certainly not like them. Uh, the 12 apostles are, are done and over with. And that general premise of the video, I very much appreciate it. I'm, I'm very much so on the same side of him on that particular issue. Um, we, we both would agree that uh, the modern apostles are uh, no longer exist in the sense of the 12. Uh, no issue there whatsoever. The issue uh, that did come up, however, is the issue of where Paul fits. Uh, one of the things that Samuel mentioned, and I would agree with, is that the word apostle is a fairly generic word in the New Testament. It gets used in lots of different ways, sometimes in a very specialized sense when it comes to the Twelve. And there's lots of other people in the New Testament that are mentioned as apostles, and it seems very generic regarding them. And the question of where Paul fits into that, is he one of the more generic apostles that's not like the Twelve, or is he an apostle that is like the Twelve and perhaps even a part of the Twelve? Uh, the position that Samuel came out on, which is a very common position, uh, I certainly acknowledge, is that he basically said that Paul was like the Twelve Apostles. Um, like I said, this is very common. There's lots of groups out there from Oneness Pentecostals uh, to Reformed guys, Evangelicals of various stripes that have said very similar things. Uh, for various and sundry reasons, a lot of times it's either uh, they do that in order to basically close apostleship down. Um, basically making the argument that Paul is the last apostle and therefore we shouldn't have any more apostles like the Twelve. Uh, there's some things that Paul said that we'll get into uh, that may indicate that. I would argue that they don't really, but uh, there are certain things that at least in a certain light could be kind of taken that way. And so sometimes people will do it for that reason. Uh, sometimes people will do it uh, to emphasize the importance of acting in the Spirit. That is, they'll look at what happened in Acts chapter 1 with the choosing of Matthias to replace Judas, and they'll say, well, that was done before Pentecost, that was done before the giving of the Holy Spirit, and therefore that is not valid. And so Paul, who comes after that time, and who was accepted later and called an apostle in the New Testament later after the day of Pentecost, he's the one who's really the true apostle. You know, you have to have a real true uh, spirit-filled uh, apostle. And so for them, it becomes an argument of the importance of acting in the Holy Spirit. Uh, the Pentecostal groups are typically a lot more like that. Um, there are other groups that will do it out of a concern for canon issues, and this is one of the issues that I've been dealing with. Uh, people will say that Paul was an apostle uh, like the Twelve, and that's why he could be one of the authors of Scripture. Now, there's some inconsistency when that comes to issues like James and Jude, and New Testament authors that are like that, and also Mark and Luke and those kinds of things. Um, so making Paul a part of the Twelve doesn't really cover some of the other authors of the New Testament they have to deal with, uh, but that's how some of them explain it and some of them uh, try to justify Paul being an author of the New Testament. There's lots of reasons uh, that people will do this. However, my problem is that a very strict lexicography applied to this term, apostle, 
uh, when you look at the context of how it is used regarding the 12 and how it's used more generically uh, in the New Testament, you find that the association of how the term is used with the 12 versus Paul, they don't overlap. Uh, lexically, the usages are distinct and different. Uh, now, to back up just a little bit, when we talk about lexicography, we're talking about basically the meaning of words and especially the meaning of words in various contexts. Um, one of the, the basic uh, tenets of all studies of ancient documents, which would include uh, the Bible, is that um, the uh, ancient speakers of those languages are not going to be bound to use their words in ways that would make sense to us. Instead, we need to pay very close attention to how they use their words, and we need to understand that their usage is oftentimes going to be context-dependent, uh, so much so that the context can radically change the meaning of words in some cases. Uh, and this is why in most lexicons, basically dictionaries of other languages, uh, that's what a lexicon basically is, it's a dictionary but for another language, um, but written for you in your own language but it's talking about another language. Um, in most lexicons, you'll see that most of the words have more than one meaning. A lot of times there'll be kind of a general concept that relate them all. Uh, that is what is known as the semantic domain, but there'll still be itemized uh, definitions. And sometimes the di difference in definitions can be uh, pretty stark to the point where one usage, even though it's the same word, one usage cannot overlap with another. Let's take in English the, uh, uh, the following sentence. Back in the day before automated mechanized transportation such as planes, trains, and automobiles, it would take many days to travel across the United States, especially if you only traveled during the day. In that sentence that I just gave you, I used the word day three times. And each time I used it in a way that was different enough from the other ways that they would not be transposable. The first time I uh, talked about day, I was using it as a reference for a general time period. In the day before automated and mechanized transportation in the time that this was applicable. That's basically what I mean. I'm referring to a time period. The second time I do it, I use a day that refers to basically a normal 24-hour day, the rotation of the Earth about its axis. And then the last time I use the word day, I use it to, uh, that is, I said it would take many days to travel across the United States, many 24-hour days. And then the last usage uh, was referring specifically to daylight. If you only travel during the day, that is, while it's still light outside. Those usages are all distinct, and you cannot take the definition from one and transpose it into the other context. That is, just because I use day at the beginning of the sentence doesn't mean that I can take the definition that is applicable to the end of the sentence and try to stuff it in there. When I say, back in the day before automated mechanized transportation, that definition of day that I'm using there cannot be uh, the definition at the end that refers only to a daylight portion of the day during the daylight time, when the sun is still uh, shining. That wouldn't make sense, you know, in the sun shining before mechanized, automated mechanized transportation, it doesn't even make any sense in the, in the sentence. But nonetheless, it's the same signifier, it's the same word each time, although the definitions are very radically different. The same thing happens in most languages across uh, the world. Uh, words will have different meanings, and sometimes those meanings are pretty well uh, linked to each other pretty strongly, and sometimes they're greatly differentiated. In the case of the word apostle, uh, the, there's kind of a general idea there of one cent. An apostle, in a very generic sense, is one cent. But sent to do what and with what authority, that varies greatly depending on context. And that's the issue that we have before us. So let's uh, take a look at this usage as we see it in the New Testament as applies to the Twelve and as it applies to other people that are called apostles in the New Testament as well. Uh, one of the most significant places that we would look for this would be in the writings of, of course, Luke and Paul. 
The reason why is because we're discussing Paul. We're saying, is Paul really one of the uh, one of the twelve, or like the twelve, or is he not? So, of course, Paul's usage of the term is going to be very important. And Luke is important because he was the companion of Paul. And a lot of times, the way that they use words is shared. Their syntax is usually uh, different. Uh, They don't always say things quite in the same way. But there is a lot of borrowing of terminology between Luke and Paul. Um, Like I said, their, their, their style is different. Uh, but a lot of times their terminology is the same and the different definitions that they use for their terms oftentimes has a lot of overlap. So let's look at Luke first. Luke chapter 6 verse 13 says this, And when day came, he, that is Jesus, called his disciples and chose from them twelve whom he named apostles. And then it goes on to list the twelve apostles. So this is one usage in uh, the Gospel of Luke of the term apostle. And these 12 that he's talking about here, uh, the choose uh, chosen from the disciples, and uh, there's not a whole lot of distinction that is given here immediately. It's just, okay, here's 12 that are special. And for the time being, in the in the narrative at least, they're kind of set to the side. But they're definitely a distinct group from the rest of the dis- and disciples. They're not like the rest of the disciples in this. There is something that is unique and special about them. That much is obvious from the context. Now, a little while later, we get to another group of apostles in Luke chapter 10. We'll just go to verse 1. There's a few places where it's mentioned in chapter 10, but verse 1 is sufficient. Um The text says this, After this, the Lord, that is referring to Jesus, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them on ahead of him, two by two, into every town and place where he himself was about to go. So this is another group of people. It's obvious that it's not the 12. Um, it's the text makes the point that this is 72 others. This is not the first group. And of course, the number is much greater than the first group. The first was 12. This is 72. And they are being sent out. That is, they're not kept off on the side. They are actively going out. And so that's one of the first distinctions that we get. We get that um, the there's one group associated with that are the, the 12 that are set aside for a particular reason and for a special purpose, but they're not necessarily ones who are going out and abroad. However, there is this other group of apostles that are going out and abroad. They're not set aside in the same way that the 12 12 are, except for the fact that they're going out to announce uh, the Lord before his uh, arrival into these towns. Um, That's the the main uh, difference that is there. Okay, so one group is set aside, the other group is sent out. First basic distinction that we get. And moving into the book of Acts, which is also written by Luke, uh, we get a lot more information uh, regarding especially the the first group. In Acts uh, chapter 1, verses 15 through 26, we have the choosing of Matthias, and this is what the text says. It says, in those days, Peter stood up among the brothers. The company of persons was in all about 120 and said, Brothers, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered among us and was allotted his share in this ministry. Now this man acquired a field with the reward of his wickedness, and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle, and all his bowels gushed out. And it became known to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so that the field was called in their own language, Akeldama, that is, field of blood. Quote, For it is written in the book of Psalms, this is uh, quoting Peter, May his camp become desolate, and let there be no one to dwell in it, and let another take his office. End quote. So one of the men, uh, sorry, in quote from the Old Testament, uh, 
So one of the men who have accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John, that is John the Baptist, from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, the day of the, the ascension, one of these men must become with us a witness to his resurrection. And they put forward two. Joseph, called Barsabas, who was also called Justus, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, You, Lord, you know the hearts of all. Show which one of these two you have chosen to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they cast lots for them, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. So here we have a lot more detail about the twelve versus the other group of apostles that was mentioned that seemed to be more generic. The twelve seem to have a legal duty. That is, it is understood that Matthias is going to be a witness. Now, the terminology that's used here is not a witness in a generic sense, just not someone who simply saw uh, something happen, but someone who saw with a certain kind of authority. Look at the requirements that are uh, put forward. It's not just that they witnessed the resurrection of Christ, but they said that this had to be someone who was there from the baptism of John the Baptist all the way up to the ascension. It's not just that they saw the resurrected Lord, but that they had to be with Jesus basically during his entire earthly ministry. And this is what cues us in to what of the many different definitions of apostle that are out there, which one is actually applicable to the 12. And what we are seeing here is an emphasis on legal viability. That is, these are people that are legally viable as the legal representatives of Christ. These are basically people who would have known Christ well enough to act as people with um, more or less power of attorney on earth. Uh, that is, when Jesus takes the twelve aside and he says, To you I give uh, the kingdom, um, uh, the keys of the kingdom, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, etc., etc. Those are all terms that have a very strong legal connotation to them. And this was not something that was uh, at all unusual in Hebrew society at the time. You can look at a lot of the surrounding documents from the time period, whether they be intertestamental documents or post-testamental documents like the Talmud and stuff like that. And you find that they have this concept. I don't know what the proper Hebrew ter uh, term is uh, for it. But they have this concept of a legal representative who more or less, in modern terms, had power of attorney, who had the authority to act like you in all essential legal matter, matters. Um, there, there was this concept that the Hebrews had of people who could represent other people in this way, but they had to be legally viable. And that's the kind of requirement that we're seeing here, is that of legal uh, viability. Now, this doesn't to say that these people didn't have any other qualities that would be associated with them, but the primary uh, requirement that they're putting forward here is that this person has to be a legally viable witness, someone who had to be someone who could fulfill the role of a legal representative, not just someone who's going out with a message, but someone who could actually stand up to scrutiny in a legally viable way could be dragged into court and answer for the one that they're representing, saying, this is what this person would have said in this situation. This is what this person taught about this, that, or the other thing. This is an authoritative uh, source. That was the kind of requirement that was put on this. Um, somebody who actually knew the person in question um, well enough to actually know. And then uh, we get to the question of, okay, where does Paul fit in that? Now, Paul, of course, did have his experience on the road to Damascus. And in that sense, um, he had a vision of the risen Lord. That is, his vision took place after Jesus had been raised from the dead. There's no doubt about that whatsoever. Uh, but... Does that fit with the emphasis that the 12 had regarding themselves? Well, more specifically, the 11 had in getting back to 12. 
their emphasis was on people who were legally viable, who had actually been there with Jesus during his earthly ministry. And Paul, while he did have a vision of the risen Lord, he was not there for Jesus' earthly ministry. The very definition that the apostles, the 12 apostles, or initially 11 and then 12 with Matthias, saw as being the quintessential element of what would limit things down to who was applicable and who wasn't, Paul didn't satisfy that requirement. Paul was not there for the earthly ministry of Jesus Christ. He was not um, there in, well, he was still alive at the time. He was in the general vicinity in that, um, but he wasn't there in the sense of uh, being one of the disciples of Jesus. He was not someone who had been with Jesus in a positive sense during his earthly ministry. Uh, in that sense, he would not be a legally viable witness of this person's life. Um, he couldn't testify to what Jesus was uh, uh, like in any direct sense. It would all have to be indirect testimony. This is what I learned from other people kind of thing. The 11, their understanding of what it took to be one of them is that it can't be indirect. You have to have actually been numbered among us from the time of John the Baptist all the way up to the Ascension. And they only found two people on the entire face of the planet who met that requirement and um, they left it in the Lord's hands beyond that. But they understood, that's where they, they cast the lot, but they understood that this was a basic requirement. They knew it had to be from this group of people uh, because this was a role as a legal representative rather than a more generic role of being sent out. And that brings us to the conclusion that Paul was not an apostle like the Twelve. Their own requirements that they state in black and white, or in this case, blue and white on the screen, their own requirements that they acknowledge being foundational to what they were doing, Paul didn't satisfy. He was not a viable legal representative of Christ in this sense. Okay. Instead, he um, had a different kind of apostleship. And when we read uh, the accounts, I believe it is, what is it? Well, there's actually a few places that the account is given. I think one of them, though, is Acts 9. Uh, one of the things that uh, we read about him, uh, let's see here. Um, here, in uh, verse 15, Acts chapter 9, verse 15, God describes what he is doing with Paul. At this time, he's called Saul. Uh, but in verse 15, it says, But the Lord said to him, that is Ananias, the person who's going to go and pray for Paul, that he would receive his sight back after being blinded by the vision he receives. Um, but the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. What is the purpose that he is giving for Paul? That he is going to be sent out. Now, with regard to the uh, first basic categories of apostle that we already talked about in the book of Luke, where does that put Paul? Is he one of the special group that is being set aside? And we learn in Acts chapter 1 that they're set aside as viable legal representatives of Christ. Or are they like the 72 that is being sent out and abroad to spread the message of the kingdom? Which one is the stated purpose of bringing Saul into the fold and giving Saul this vision? The stated purpose is that he would be sent out. That is, Paul is much more similar to the 72 that Christ sends out in Luke chapter 10 than he is to the 12 that are set aside, like in Luke chapter 6. Okay, basic uh, semantics uh, being applied, basic contextual analysis being applied here says that Paul was not an apostle like the 12. The 12 were set aside. In Acts chapter 1, uh, we learn that it is a legal representation role that they have. They basically have power of attorney to say what Christ would have uh, said, basically. This is what Christ would have said in this situation. They knew Christ well enough to know those kinds of things. Um, that's one usage of apostle. And the other is much more generic with the emphasis being on being sent out with the basic gospel message, the basic message of the kingdom of God going forth. 
very, very basically in the description and God's own description of what uh, Paul was going to be doing is that he's going to be sent out. Um, contextually, lexically, um, even though it's very common for people to try to put Paul with the Twelve, the text is very clear in its usage. He is not numbered with the Twelve. His ministry is not like theirs. His is not a ministry of a legally viable representative of Christ um, who has power of attorney, basically. His is one of going out and spreading the, the message of the kingdom. Um, his is much more akin to what we in the modern would call a missionary, and Samuel even talks about this distinction in his video, saying that there are the 12 apostles who have a special authority, and then there are those who are being sent out, and they're much more akin to what we would call a modern missionary. Well, Paul seems like uh, much more so like he is one of these more common missionaries. And people uh, will sometimes object and say, well, Paul very obviously calls himself a apostle, and he seems to put that forward with, with the supposition that this carries with it a, a certain amount of authority. And I would say that people who are trying to suppose things like that are not reading very carefully. Let's take a look at one of the places where Paul does that that really shows what I'm talking about here. Let's go to Romans chapter 1, and we'll look at verses 1 through 6. All right, so Romans chapter 1, verses 1 through 6 says, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. Now, just in that first verse, okay, before we get to the rest of it, just in that first verse, a lot of people look at that and say, well, so Paul was especially special. I mean, how many other people were talking about themselves like this? I mean, this is, you know, really strong language that really sets uh, Paul apart, doesn't it? Well, the first verse by itself seems to, but let's read on. So, uh, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. By the way, right after, he, and it is worth mentioning here, right after he says that he was called to be an apostle, what's the very next thing that he mentions? He's set apart for the gospel. He's not set apart for being a legal representative, he's not uh, set apart for the role of witness and testimony like the Twelve are. That's worth pointing out. A lot of people miss that, but moving on. Which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh, and was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the Spirit of holiness, by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the nations, including you who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. Again, what is the purpose for which Paul has this uh, uh, apostleship? To bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the nations. Is this a being set aside for the purpose of being legally viable witnesses who can authoritatively say what Christ would have said in a given situation, or is it for the purpose of going out with the message of the kingdom of God? Again, it seems really clear that Paul was being sent out with the message of the kingdom of God. He's an apostle like the 72, not the 12. But one of the things that I want to point out is here in verse 5 that it says, uh, through whom we have received grace and apostleship. Who's the we? This is Paul, right? This is just uh, Paul writing to the Romans. Well, actually, it isn't. Uh, this is something that you have with ancient documents uh, sometimes. A lot of times, ancient documents were written kind of more or less as a group effort, usually between the primary author and an amanuensis, basically a scribe. A lot of people were not overly riddled literate themselves in terms of being able to write. A lot of them could usually read at least well enough to get by, but a lot of them would not write on their own. They would have to go to a scribe to do that, and the fancy term for the scribe was amanuensis. Um, 
And so most of the ancient documents that we have, whether they be letters or other kinds of documents, are usually actually composed by at least two people, the primary author and the person who's taking it all down. And there'd usually be a little bit of back and forth between them as to how they wanted to word things and whatnot. Um, it was usually a little bit of an effort that way, but sometimes it got to be much more uh, than that. Sometimes you would have letters that would be written by one person primarily, um, but would have the input of a lot of uh, people. And in letters to churches, this would especially be the case. You'd usually have, um, uh, like, you know, the primary elder of a church writing to another church, but all the other elders would be writing the letter with him, would still be in the room while he's dictating it to the amanuensis, and they would have their input as well. And so while there might be one primary author, there'd be a lot of other people that would be involved. Uh, for example, according to church tradition, at least, that is the case of how the Gospel of John came about. I think it was Clement of Alexandria who uh, said that the Gospel of John was written by John and Andrew and other unnamed disciples. And this is actually perfectly coincident with what we find in the Gospel of John. In the Gospel of John, there's an aside towards the end in which um, the, the narrative breaks off to say, and we know that this disciple's testimony is true or something to that effect, but it puts it in the plural. We know this about this person. Who's the we if it's John's uh, uh, gospel? Well, it's John and all the people who were, who were with him while he was writing. He was probably the primary author and perhaps the primary scribe, um, but other people were involved. The text itself says that there were multiple people involved. We know that his testimony is true. There are obviously other people involved, and like I said, church history records that there were other people involved. Andrew and other disciples that were not named in church history. Um, this is the same thing that we have going on in verse 5 here of Romans 1. We have received grace and apostleship. Whoever else is writing Romans with Paul, and we'll get to that in a second, because the book of Romans does actually name it. Not all of the ancient letters would necessarily name the amanuensis, uh, but Romans does happen to name the amanuensis. And whoever it is that's writing with Paul seems to think that his apostle, that he has an apostleship, and that his apostleship is like the apostle Paul's apostleship. So if the supposition that Paul was like the twelve is correct, we would expect that the person who is going to be writing this letter with Paul would be one of the twelve. Like I said, like Matthew or Peter or John or someone like that. If his apostleship is like the 12 and not a more generic form of that word, not a more generic form of apostleship that would coincide with the 72 that were sent out, if that's the case, if he was really a part of the 12, we would expect one of the 12 to be writing with him because whoever it is says that we have received grace and apostleship. If, uh, whoever is writing with Paul thinks that they have apostleship as well. And it's the same kind of apostleship that Paul does. So if Paul is a part of the Twelve, the author who is writing this with Paul better be one of the Twelve. So let's see who it actually was. This is at the end of the Book of Romans where it reveals who it is who is writing this alongside uh, Paul. And just to give a little bit of context, we'll do a few verses around it. Uh, 21 through 23. So Romans chapter 16, verses 21 through 23. Uh, let's see what it says. So this is at the end of the book of Romans. It says, Timothy, my fellow worker, greets you. So do Lucius and Jason and Sosipater, my kinsmen. Verse 22. I, Tertius, who wrote this letter, greet you in the Lord. Gaius, who is host to me, and to the whole church greets you, Erastus the city treasurer, and our brother Quartus greets you. So there in the middle of all these greetings, we have the person who is actually writing this thing with Paul. It's Tertius. And this is the person who thinks that he has an apostleship along with Paul. And like I said, if Paul's apostleship was like unto the twelve, this person who was writing along with him should have been one of the twelve. It should have been Matthias or Matthew, or it should have been John or Peter, someone like that. Thaddeus, whoever the case happens to be, 
But no, it's not. It's not any of them. Instead, it's Tertius. Was Tertius an apostle? Well, according to the book of Romans, 1, 5 and 16.22, Tertius was an apostle. He had an apostleship. He says, we have an apostleship. And he names himself as the other author of the letter. Paul, obviously the, the primary author, but Tertius as the amanuensis, as the scribe. And he uses uh, we to describe the apostleship. Whatever his apostleship was, it was like Paul's. And like I said, there is no historical tradition out there that I'm aware of anything in church history at all that would say that Tertius ever was associated with the Twelve. Tertius had an apostleship. That's what the Book of Romans says. But it's really clear that it wasn't like the Twelve proper. And if Tertius's apostleship wasn't like the Twelve, then that means that Paul's apostleship wasn't like the Twelve. Okay, so that is the positive uh, case for why uh, people would say that lexically and contextually, Paul was not like the Twelve. Okay. He had an apostleship, but his apostleship seems to have been different. The same kind of apostleship that Tertius had. The same kind of apostleship by which he was sent out. That's what the Lord said to Ananias. That I'm going to send him out to the Gentiles, to the kings, and even to the people of Israel. But it's a sending out kind of apostleship. Not a setting aside for being legal witnesses, but going out and spreading the, the message of the kingdom. That kind of apostleship. Lexically, contextually, very clear that that is the case, I would argue. But nonetheless, there are people who argue that, no, Paul really was like that. And Samuel, in his video, uh, brought up some objections. And as far as I could determine, there was only two real objections uh, that Samuel brought up to why uh, this view of Paul, that Paul wasn't really part of the Twelve, but rather his apostleship was the more generic kind. Um, Samuel's argument against that seemed to consist of basically two arguments. And his first argument was that Paul calls himself the last apostle. And this would only be uh, appropriate if he's talking about uh, an apostle that is like um, uh, like the, uh, the Twelve, because there are other people that came later, like Tertius, for example, that were also called apostles, uh, that had an apostleship. Uh, but if Paul calls himself the last, and there's these other people that come later, then he must not have been the last in the generic sense that these other people are. He but it must have been last in the first sense, like the Twelve. And Samuel pointed to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 for that, and we'll just read verses 1 through 9, because that's what's most applicable here. Uh, so this is Paul writing to the Corinthians, and he says, Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I deliver to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was he was raised on the third day according in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, and worthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. Samuel pointed to this passage and says, Look, Paul calls himself the last of the apostles. He is the last uh, one to whom Christ arise and there, uh, to whom Christ appeared. And therefore, he is like uh, the twelve. Because there are other people who were apostles later, and there's even other appearances of Jesus that we have later. And the fact that he's calling himself last uh, of all here, means that he must not be in that broader category. Well, like I said, lexically and contextually, that is not a valid reading of this passage. Okay, so let's talk about uh, this in general. Okay, so we have uh, 
uh, this uh, description of what the uh, gospel is, which uh, is, uh, is signified by the things that Jesus uh, did. Uh, that Jesus died for our sins, was buried, raised again on the, uh, the third day. And then after he was raised again, his resurrection uh, was witnessed by various and sundry people. First Cephas, that is Peter, and then the twelve. So we have Cephas, we have the twelve. Then there's 500 people that are kind of unnamed here, but there's 500 uh, other people uh, that all have to who, who all see the risen Jesus at one time, um, and this would be important uh, for the Hebrews legally speaking, because if you have multiple people that claim to see someone at the same time, that is considered to be stronger te uh, testimony and witness. If you say that you met with someone last night, well. Maybe you met with him, maybe you didn't. But if you say you met with him and your um, buddy Frank was also, also with you, and your buddy Frank also says that you met with this other person, then that's considered stronger because you have them all witnessing the same event, not just the same person, but the same event. It was this person at this time in this place, and you have multiple people all saying that it was this person at this time in this place. So that would have been considered strong testimony. And then we have an appearance to James and then to all the apostles. And then last of all, Paul. Anyone who's familiar with the Hebrew context immediately understands what is going on here. And that is that um, Paul is going through a primacy of witness. That is the most important witness was Cephas. Cephas was usually considered, Cephas, that is Peter, he was considered the leader of the Twelve. And uh, his place as the leader of the Twelve, the people who knew Jesus most intimately, his testimony is going to be the most important because he is the one who knows Jesus best. He is the one who can say, no, that really was Jesus that appeared to me even though I saw him die on the cross. I know it was really him because I really know Jesus. And the twelve also really knew Jesus. Not as well as Cephas did, not as well as Peter did, but they also really knew Jesus and can really identify him. Hey, we know the guy. We hung out with him for three years, all the way from the baptism of John, all the way up to the ascension. We knew the guy. We can identify that he really did rise uh, from the dead that this miracle really did uh, take place that fulfills the ministry of Jesus uh, Christ. And then, like I said, then Paul switches to the next level of importance, which was these 500 people who all witnessed Jesus at the same time and place. Like I said, in the Hebrew conception, when you have multiple people who are witnessing the same event at the same time in the same place, that's considered stronger witness. So people who really knew Jesus well that's the first importance, because you have to have people who could actually identify him. And then the testimony of a great many witnesses all at the same time and place would be of next importance. And then you have uh, Jesus appearing to James. James was one of the brothers of the Lord, and you read through the gospel accounts, and it doesn't really seem like James was overly involved in Jesus' life, except when he was basically causing trouble for the family, and then James and the brothers would show up. Um, but for the most part, he doesn't seem to be as involved, and because of that, his witness would not be as important. And then the same thing with the apostles. The apostles here is very likely referring to uh, the same uh, group of people that were there uh, in the upper room praying back at Acts uh, chapter 1. So you have uh, the 12, of course. You have Jesus' mother and brothers all there. And then there's a bunch of other people that brings the total up to 120. Um, this is probably referring to that particular period of uh, time, that those other uh, people had also uh, seen the risen Lord and would have been a, a part of uh, the brothers. And these are people um, to... Uh, who would have uh, been concerned with spreading the message of uh, the kingdom. So what Paul is doing here, to anyone who knows the way the Hebrew system of witness works, they see there he's going through who is the most important witness going to the last. And that's exactly what he does in uh, verse 8. He says, last of all, 
um, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. He says, I'm a witness. I know that Jesus is alive because he appeared to me on the road to da and Damascus. But he's recognizing that his witness is not like the apostles, uh, the general apostles that are mentioned here in verse 7. It's not like James. It's not like the 500. It's not like the 12. It's not like Cephas. Last in the sense of furthest removed from authority. And that's, <clears throat> ah, excuse me. And that's one of the issues that we have here is that when it says last of all, the word that is used there, uh, let's go ahead and look it up here. Do, 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 verse 8, eschaton. Um, eschaton is a word that can be temporal, last, final, uh, opposite protos, which would be first. Uh, but... What's interesting is that in the Freiburg lexicon, which is what I have up on the screen here, the first uh, definition is not temporal. The first definition of eschatosk is locational. That is, the first definition is that it is the farthest, removed from something. And then goes on to say the end, the farthest point. And then secondarily, as the second uh, definition, it can be of time, which would be last and latest. But that term is not primarily a time-dependent term. That term is actually primary, a lo primarily a locative term, saying the furthest removed from all of this is me. And that's why he says, as to one untimely born. Um, I'm so far removed from all of this that it's bizarre and strange that he appeared to me. And then in verse 9, he goes on to say, For I am the least of the apostles and worthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. Now, uh, Samuel was very adamant that since he says, you know, I'm called an apostle, that must mean he's like the twelve. Well, no. Lexically and contextually, Paul has already separated himself from the twelve. They were mentioned all the way back up in verse 5. There's lots of other people that he mentions before he finally gets to himself. And the people that he mentions in between were not like the twelve. The 500 that all saw Jesus at one time even though their testimony, because it is a group witness, multiple people have seen this person at this time and place all at the same time, um, even though that's strong from a, a sense of testimony and witness, um, that's definitely not eh, like the 12 word. They didn't know Jesus as intimately. And then James, James didn't know Jesus as intimately during his earthly ministry. He was only there for parts of it. And then to all the apostles, um, seems to be encapsulating, you know, all the people uh, that had uh, gone out, uh, perhaps. That seems to have been the case that the 72 that Jesus had sent out um, later on after the resurrection had come back into the fold, as it were, and they were also uh, uh, privy to the risen Lord. Um, the last mention that uh, Paul has of the apostles here is obviously distinct from the Twelve. There is no lexically contextual way that you can argue that this usage of apostles is meant to be equivalent with the Twelve. No, the Twelve were already mentioned. Other people were mentioned in between, going from those who had the closest, best uh, regarded testimony to those whose testimony would be least regarded being the furthest out. And that's where Paul puts himself. His was the furthest out. It was the eschatos, the, the, uh, the furthest away. Um, eschatos, like I said, we oftentimes associate it with time, but primarily it actually isn't. It's primarily locative, not chronological. Um, and then how is it that Paul further qualifies himself? He says, for I am the least of the apostles. Okay, so the word that he uses that could be used chronologically or locatively, eschatos, it can be used both ways. He further qualifies in verse 9 by talking about himself being the least. That is not chronological. That's very cl uh, clearly in terms of importance. And this is not at all unusual uh, for Paul. Uh, don't forget that this is the same one who um, uh, said that he was the chief of all sinners, uh, chief of all sinners in 1 Timothy 1.15. Uh, that's what he tells and Timothy, you know, 
or how Christ came to die for sinners, of which I am the chief, of which I am the most. Um, Paul's position that he's putting forward is a position of humility, um, saying that he is the one who is least and deserving as far as he's concerned. Now, that doesn't mean that there has never ever been a person who was uh, more sinful than Paul. Paul himself calls himself the chief of sinners in 1 Timothy 1.15, but that doesn't mean that there weren't, eh, weren't any more sinful people in the past or that there wouldn't be any more sinful people in the future. No, it was Paul simply being humble regarding his position, recognizing that he did not get what he deserved. Instead, he got grace instead. Um, that is, he recognized that everything that he got from Christ, he did not deserve at all. And uh, that drove him to his knees. That is, you know, Paul doesn't know everybody else's heart, but he does know his own. And out of all the people that he does know, he knows that he's the worst. That's in, in the sense in which he says that he's the chief of sinners. And that's also the same sense in which he says, I am the least of the apostles. Remember, Tertius grouped himself with Paul. And Tertius, we don't really know anything about. In terms of impact on history, I would argue that Tertius is lef less of an apostle than Paul was. When Paul is saying that he's the least of the apostles here, he's not talking about in terms of importance on the grand scale. He's talking about relative to what he knows, and what he knows is his own heart, and he knows how sinful it is. He knows just how much he hated the cause of Christ to begin with and how much his mind and heart had been changed since encountering Christ on the road to Damascus. Okay. All right, so... Does the fact that um, Paul says that he was uh, the one that Jesus appeared to last mean that he was the last of the twelve? No. The last that is talked about here is just order of importance with regard to witness. Uh, Cephas was the most important witness of uh, the re uh, resurrection, and Paul was the least important witness of the resurrection. That's all that it means. He was the furthest removed in terms of uh, witness aerial authority regarding the resurrection. Uh, has absolutely no term, uh, connection with him being the Twelve, because like I said, he separates himself from the Twelve quite obviously. Uh, there's Cephas in the Twelve up in verse 5. There's other people that are mentioned in between, and the group uh, that he is um, uh, juxtaposing himself with in terms of apostleship is the group that is uh, com uh, mentioned in the same breath as James, who was definitely not a part of the Twelve. The last antecedent for apostles was in conjunction with James, not the Twelve. Whatever he's thinking of our apostles here, it's not in association with the Twelve. That should be fairly obvious. Now, another thing that uh, Samuel brought up was that in 2 Corinthians 12, 11, Paul says um, that he is, um, uh, that he says that he is um, not the least of all the apostles. And uh, Samuel's argument was that that wouldn't make sense if he was talking about, you know, the more generic usage of apostle, you know, the least of all missionaries. In uh, 2 Corinthians 12, 11, it says this. He says, I have been a fool. This is Paul speaking. You forced me to it. Uh, for I ought to have been commended by you, for I was not at all inferior to these super apostles, even though I am nothing. He says, I was not at all inferior to these super apostles. And clearly, that must be Paul talking about the Twelve, being like the Twelve, because nobody would contest that he was a missionary, because obviously he'd gone out on missionary journeys and whatnot. Everybody knew that he was a missionary. They wouldn't be contesting that. It would obviously that they'd be contesting that he had authority like the Twelve. Really? Who are the super apostles that Paul is comparing himself with. Well, you go back and you read the Corinthian letters. Uh, yes, it does include people like Cephas, but also includes people like Apollos, who's not associated with the Twelve. When he's talking about apostles here, it seems to be in the generic sense. Because like I said, in the, book, uh, in the letters to the Corinthians, 
the uh, group of people that he mentions seems to be much more expansive. Like I said, it includes Apollos. He's not a part of the Twelve. Apollos was not a part of the Twelve, and yet that is one of the people that Paul is putting himself up against as being the uh, the apostles that the Corinthians like as opposed to him. They like Cephas, they like Apollos, but they don't like that Paul guy. Paul's weird and he's mean and he's, you know, mean in his letters, but he's always so loving towards us when he, you know, when he gets here. He's just fickle Paul. You know, they, eh, we, we like Apollos and Cephas better. For the Corinthians, those were who they seem to consider to be the super apostles. And that's who Paul is comparing himself eh, to. That's not uh, strictly the Twelve, because it includes Apollos. Okay. So, least of all, uh, Paul wasn't saying, you know, I was not at all inferior to uh, the missionaries. I was not the least of all uh, uh, the missionaries. No. And now, in the context of the Corinthian letters, he uh, puts as these people that he's comparing himself to people who are outside the Twelve, like Apollos primarily. And historically, uh, the issue of people actually being legitimate missionaries was actually an issue. Uh, Samuel said, oh, oh, this wouldn't be contested at all because it was super obvious that Paul was uh, a missionary. No, what he was contesting was stronger than that. Well, I would say that you don't know your church history very well, and I'm not trying to be mean in saying that. I'm just saying that church history tells us a little bit different story. Uh, let's, up on the, the screen I have here now, a uh, part of the Didache. The Didache is the teaching of the Twelve. It is an ancient Christian document. Just how ancient it is is somewhat disputed. Uh, some people would put it as early as the first century. Some people would put it as late as the third century. I happen to believe that it is probably in the first century, but relatively late in the first century. And part of that will become fairly clear as we read through here. But this is chapter 11 of the Didache, of the teaching of the Twelve. And it talks about people who are traveling around calling themselves apostles and prophets. And it gives advice as to which of these people to receive and which ones not. I'll just start in the beginning here of the chapter. Excuse me. It says, Whosoever therefore cometh and teacheth you all these things that have been said before, receive him. I want to go ahead and stop right there to point out something that Samuel definitely would agree with, and that is that the gospel had already been established by this time. Whatever period you want to put this, somewhere between the 1st and the 3rd century, uh, it is clear that it is operating at a time when people already understood that the message had already been authoritatively revealed. And that if you're going to come along preaching the message, it has to agree with what has already been said before. Okay. First point I wanted to point out here is that even in the Didache, by the time of the Didache, they're saying, this is closed, it's over and done with, everything new has already been revealed, there's nothing new to add. It goes on to say, but if the teacher himself turn and teach another doctrine to the destruction of this, hear him not. But if he teach so as to increase righteousness and the knowledge of the Lord, receive him as the Lord. But concerning apostles and prophets, according to the decree of the gospel, thus do. Let every apostle that cometh to you be received as the Lord, but he shall not remain except one day. But if there be need, also the next. But if he remain three days, he is a false prophet. And when the apostle goeth away, let him take nothing but bread until he lodgeth. But if he ask money, he is a false prophet. And it goes on and gives a lot more instructions from there as to identify uh, true apostles and false apostles, true prophets and false prophets. But like I said, I wanted to point out that this is already assuming that authoritative revelation, new authoritative re re revelation has already been given. They don't have the authority to do this. So whatever sense it's talking about apostles and prophets in the Didache, it's not talking about them 
in the sense of authoritative revelation, like the Twelve would have, because they were the legally viable witnesses, legally viable legal representatives of Jesus Christ. So it's not talking about apostles and prophets like the Twelve. Um, it's talking about people who are teaching things that have to be in accord with what is already revealed. So it's definitely in a lesser sense of apostle and prophet. But what's interesting is that it was understood that people were going around doing this and causing problems. There were people who were obviously stealing. They were using this as a way of uh, making money. That were using this as a way of fleecing people and getting them to basically, you know, pay their uh, their wage and whatnot. And so, in the Didache, it goes through and gives all of these criteria for making sure that you don't get fleeced by these uh, people and making sure that they're really teaching uh, the truth and those kinds of things. The idea that there were a lot of charlatans out there seems to have been very primitive. And personally, I would put, uh, as I mentioned before, I would put the Didache late in the first century. It is very clearly after the gospel has been well established, so it'd be after the time of the Twelve. But it was early enough that they were still talking about people being prophets and apostles, obviously in a lesser sense, but they were still using that terminology, and it was still in the early missionary phase of the church before um, this had been, become something that was fairly wide known in the, the Roman Empire at the time. And so, like I said, I feel pretty comfortable putting it somewhere in the uh, latter part of the, the first century. Um, just because of uh, passages like this that are in, contained in the Didache. Uh, but what it shows that would be relative to uh, Samuel's point is that these people who are going around proclaiming the gospel, there are enough charlatans out there that people were concerned whether or not these people were legitimate. So the fact that uh, Paul says, you know, I was not inferior to these super apostles in no way means that he was talking about uh, the Twelve. Uh, there are these people who are going around making a great uh, name for themselves as basically missionaries. And this is the group of people that Paul would have been concerned about, these uh, false apostles, these false prophets that were coming around claiming to have the message of Christ, but... Uh, having rather ulterior motives in doing so, a lot of times for monetary gain, but also for the um, purpose of uh, purveying their own doctrine and theology in contrast to what was first established. Uh, historically, this kind of defense that Paul would give fits much more so with the more generic use of the word apostle rather than of the twelve, because it was those generic apostles who were going every which way that were causing the problems. And this is what Paul would have to defend himself against. Contextually, historically, contextually, that makes sense. All right. And then, of course, uh, Paul asks, you know, am I not an apostle? And that is in 1 Corinthians 9.1. He says, am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are not you my workmanship in the Lord? And Samuel pointed to this passage and said, well, he says, am I not an apostle? Obviously, people wouldn't be contending um, if he was just simply saying, I'm a missionary. Well, like I said, historically, people did contest whether people were valid missionaries or not. That's what the Didache, uh, chapter 11 of the Didache, is about, that entire chapter. And there's also a, a section later on that goes on to talk about it in further detail. Uh, so there's actually a couple of sections of the Didache, a couple of chapters of the Didache, that are devoted just to that topic of receiving these missionaries and who is a true missionary and who isn't. Um, it was obviously a concern at the time. So this statement from Paul in which he says, am I not an apostle, isn't definitive because historically that the generic use of the word apostle was also contested. Are you actually going out with the true message of Christ or not? Um, that was uh, something that was uh, known to be contested. And like I said, it's very clear in the Didache that when it's talking about apostles and prophets that are in contest, it's not talking about the twelve. Because uh, it writes with the assumption that what they've established has already been sufficiently established. It's not saying that these people are like the, uh, the Twelve. It's contrasting their authority. Uh, they obviously had a derived authority. They weren't allowed to contradict what had come before.
Okay. But even if you read further on in 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 9, instead of just verse 1, you go verses 1 and 2, there's a broader context even in that letter that would show that that's probably not what Paul is talking about. So to recap, Paul says, Am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are you not my workmanship in the Lord? Verse 2, If to others I am not an apostle, at least I am to you, for you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. Well, if Paul was like the twelve, why would he need people that he had been ministering to to be the seal of his apostleship? If he was like the twelve, the seal of his apostleship would have been like their seal, which was the fact that they had been with Jesus for his earthly ministry from the time of John the Baptist up to the ascension of Christ. That was their seal. That was what they made them viable legal representatives of Christ. But that's not where Paul puts the seal of his apostleship. Instead, it's on the fact that he had been responsible, indirectly, it's ultimately the Lord, of course, but the Lord had worked through him to reach the Corinthians. And that's what Paul says is the seal of his apostleship. He says, if I'm not an apostle to others, I am to you. That is, I didn't go. If I didn't go to others, it's nonetheless true that I did go to you. What kind of apostleship is Paul referring to? It's the kind that you get sent out. It's the kind that is like the apostleship of the 72 in Luke chapter 10. It's not like the apostleship of the 12 in Luke chapter 6. No, it's the sending out kind of apostleship. I might not be an apostle to everybody else, but I am to you because you know that you came to Christ through what God did through me among you. And then this part where it says, Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? A lot of people think that that is Paul referring to the fact, you know, I, I saw the risen Lord on the road to Damascus. Again, this is where knowing the history of the church is very helpful. Um, the very common analogy in the early church was the analogy of illumination. That is, when you became a Christian, you were illuminated. That is, you saw the light. When Paul says, have I not seen Jesus our Lord? He's saying, haven't I been illuminated as well? Haven't I seen uh, the light? Okay. That is, I've seen the light. I've been truly drawn to Christ. And I am continuing in Christ. And the fact that you guys have come to know about Christ through what God did through me is proof that I am, in fact, genuine in the message that I am bringing to you. There is nothing here that in its historical context would have led anyone in the early church to conclude that Paul was saying that he was like the Twelve. Nothing. This is all coincident with Paul claiming to have had a genuine conversion and Paul claiming that he had, in fact, given a proper gospel message to these people. Uh, but that's all that this would imply to the early uh, Christian audience. Um, okay, the kind of apostleship that he is talking about here is the kind of apostleship that results in conversion of other people. It's not like uh, the apostleship of the Twelve. It's like the apostleship of the Seventy-Two. Okay. Like I said, lexically, contextually, um, there is absolutely no doubt that Paul was not a part of the Twelve, nor was he like the Twelve. His apostleship was decidedly distinct. Now, this is not an objection that Samuel raised in that video that I talk about, but it is an objection that some people raise, and that is that Paul claims that he did the signs of an apostle. That is in 2 Corinthians 12, 12. Uh, Paul says, The signs of a true apostle were performed among you with utmost patience, with signs and wonders and mighty works. Well, the fact that he had great supernatural power, doesn't that prove that Paul was like the Twelve? No, because signs and powers why the Twelve did perform signs and wonders. I mean, there's John and Peter, you know, going to the temple, healing the man, all that kind of stuff. There are definitely signs and wonders that the Twelve did perform. But the issue is that early on, uh, the signs and wonders were not limited to just the Twelve. Uh, 
again, going back to kind of the foundational passages that we started with to separate the two groups, uh, in Luke chapter 10, verses 17 through 20, we read this. It says, The 72 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. The 72 obviously had supernatural power. They were doing supernaturally mighty things. But the 72 were not the 12. Okay, The sign gifts, as we call them, were not limited to the 12, very clearly. So the fact that Paul talks about performing the true signs and apostle to these people has absolutely no bearing on whether or not he's part of the 12 because it wasn't unique to the 12. Yeah, absolutely no bearing on that uh, whatsoever. You had the general 72 who had this power as well. Um, now, some people might think that that is an argument for continuationism. You know, if, it, if signs and uh, wonders were not limited to the 12, and we admit that the, the 12 was ceased, but, you know, there's a general sense of apostles still out there, and this other general group can uh, perform signs and wonders, then maybe we can too. Uh, no. Um, but I'm not going to get into a whole lot of detail right here because this presentation is not about the sign gifts. If you do, or if you are wondering about the sign gifts, though, and how that fits into the biblical schema as a whole, and why uh, a good many groups that are very thoroughly biblical are at least functionally cessationist, if not formally cessationist, I would suggest that you look up my previous um, presentation on the canon of Scripture because I talk about the sign gifts in that uh, presentation in quite a bit of detail. And I will try to remember to put a link in the description box. A few things that I obviously need to link to in the description box. All right. Um, but yeah, that is basically the, the issue for Samuel. I appreciated his presentation on why we shouldn't um, uh, be eager to call people apostles in the modern. And on the whole of what he was saying, I agree with him. But I very much so uh, reject the idea that Paul was like the Twelve. And the reason why I reject it is because semantically and contextually, that position cannot be justified. Um, semantically and contextually, it is very clear that Paul never saw himself as a part of the Twelve. No one else saw him as part of the Twelve. And even uh, Tertullian, for example, and this is something that is in the description box of the other video that I talked about of mine that was on the subject of the canon. Uh, but even Tertullian, uh, one of the early uh, church fathers, uh, was very adamant about the fact that Paul was not like the, uh, the Twelve. And that, that was, in fact, one of the mistakes that the early heretic Marcion had made, was to uh, think that Paul was like the Twelve in any way, sh any shape, or form, or had an authority uh, that was equal to or superior to the Twelve. Um, yeah, Tertullian roundly rejected that notion. Uh, and I would argue that generally in church history that they did not see Paul as being part of the Twelve, or like the Twelve, or the Thirteenth Apostle, or anything even remotely close to that. Um, yeah, that's just not a valid uh, position. Um, like I said, when you actually get into it and look at how these words were used in the Bible and how they were understood in early Christianity, it's really clear that the sense in which Paul is referred to as an apostle is not the same sense in which the Twelve were. Uh, they are definitely distinct. All right. Thank you all very much for your time and attention. For those of you who are in Christ, go with God and be blessed. For those of you who are not, I pray that you would come to know the true Christ of history, the only genuine Savior of mankind. Amen.